my YouTube channel, Maritime Skipper. Today, we'll be talking about the Ocean Liner and Steamship SS Oceanic, which was a steamship for the Ocean Steam Navigation Company, or most commonly known as the White Star Line. Some good news for my for my channel is that I be getting I will be getting a mic for my iPad soon, so that the audio is is good, clearing and more clear to get you know feedback. Yes, so I hope you all enjoy, and let's get on, shall we? Armis Oceanic was a transatlantic ocean liner built for the White Star Line. She sailed on her maiden voyage on 6 September 1899 was the largest ship in the world until 1901. At the outbreak of World War I, she was converted to, the, to an armed merchant cruiser. On 8 August 1914, she was commissioned into the Royal Navy Service. 25th August 1914, the newly designed HMS Oceanic departed Southampton to patrol the waters from the North Scottish mainland to Faroe. Late September, she ran aground and was wrecked off the island of Fowler in the Shetland Island. Background In the late 1890s, the White Star Line's existing prestige line was majestic and Teutonic, both launched in 1889, had become outmodeled due to rapid advances in marine technology. Their competitors from the Cunard Line had introduced the Campania and Luc Lucrania in 1893, and from 1897, the German North. I try my best to pronounce it, sorry. Nofstuster Leroy began introducing four new Kaiser class Austin liners, which induced the SS Kaiser Wilhelm the Gross. In order to compete with these ships, the White Star Line needed to produce a new flag a new flagship which could rival them. Eighteen ninety seven, White Star put ceramic to service. She was bigger than Teutonic and majestic, but not the largest in the world. Simric was larger than the Campania and Lucrana, but not faster. Simric introduced the, strat the strategy of luxury over speed. Why Starline used this strategy in Oceanic? Design and construction. Their new flagship, Oceanic, was built at Holland and Wolf's Queens Island Yard at Belfast, as was a tradition with White Starline ships. No keel was laid down in 1897. She used the luxury of a speed strategy, which first began with the Simric in 1897. She was named after their first successful line of RMS Oceanic in 1870. RMS Oceanic back then in 1870 was mostly similar to the Atlantic, which we talked about before. It was to be the first ship to exceed Brunei's SS Great Eastern in length. The SS Great Eastern was the most biggest, in my words, the Oceanic line in the 1800s. Um, the Great Houston had four funnels that could fit up to 4,000 4, passengers, which is a lot. But it did have some, you know, things that need to work out, and I might be doing a video about it. Hope, maybe, hopefully, yes. Although not in tonnage. At first, at 17,272 gross register tons, the future Queen of the Oceans cost 1 million pounds sterling, equivalent to 119 million 760,000 pounds in 2021, and required 1,500 ship rights to complete. Oceanic was now, however, designed to be the fastest ship afloat or complete for the Blue Ribbon, as it was a White Star Line's policy to focus on size and comfort rather than speed. Oceanic was designed for a service speed of 21 knots, 39 kilometers per hour, 24 miles per hour. So it was powered by two four-cylinder triple expansion engines, which were, construct which were constructed the largest of their type in world, could produce 28,000 IHP. In order to build the ship, a new 500-ton overhead gantry crane had to be constructed at the yard in order to lift the material necessary for the ship's construction. Another innovation was the use of hydraulic rotating machines, which were used for the first time at Holland and Wolf during the construction. Oceanic bridge was integrated with her superstructure, giving her a clean, fluid look. The design feature would be emanated from the next big four white star ships, Seatrix, Celtic, Baltic, and Adriatic, to the Arbus Distinguishable Island Bridges. Nothing but a very finest was Ismay's policy toward this new venture. 
The architect Richard Norman Shaw was employed as a consultant for the design of much of the interiors and of the ship, which were lavishly decorated in first class sections. Oceanic was built to accommodate 1,710 passengers, 410 first class, 300 second class, and 1,000 third class, plus 349 crew. In his autobiography, Titanic and other ships, Charles Lightall gave an account of what it was like to be an officer on this vessel. Her passenger combinations were laid out in a manner similar to that of the Teutonic and Majestic with first class and amidships. Second class is at the aft end of the superstructure, and third class that divide at the forward and aft ends of the west of on four decks. Promenade, upper saloon, and main. First class occupies, occupies spaces of all four decks, most of which were dedicated to an array of spacious and comfortable single, two both and three both cabinets. There's a library on the promenade deck and a smoke room at the aft end of the upper deck with the most Sorry, at the aft end of the upper deck, with the most impressive feature being the elegant dome, which capped the first class dining room on the saloon deck. First class dining room boasted both a piano and an organ. There are buffs for valets and ladies, maids, in close proximity to first class accommodations. Similar to what was seen in both Teutonic and Majestic, second class accommodations are both of, of, of more modest elegance, but spacious and comfortable. A separate deck house at the after and the superstructure provide both open and closed promenade decks and house the library and smoking room, which was scaled down with into the first class counterparts. Same scaling down was seen with the second class landing room, which could see 148 in a way of comfortable two both and four both cabins. Third class, as was customary on all white stalling vessels on the North Atlantic, strictly segregated. Are at opposite ends of the vessel of the upper saloon and main deck. On the upper deck, entrances were located adjacent to the forward and aft well decks, where most of the laboratories were located. At the very aft end of the deck were the third class smoking room, smoke rooms and general rooms, as well as a gallery. Single men were both in five compartments at the forward end of the vessel, two on the saloon deck, three on the main deck. Each of which were laid out in a rather novel design for pin puffs. Because of both in third class was disappeared at either end of the vessel, the four compartments each has buffs for roughly 100 men, whereas conventional opening buffs dormitories often buffed up to 300 passengers on other ships. This allowed for a more open layout, which is far less crowded, complete with long tables and wooden benches where male passengers were served their meals. In the aft quarters of the ship for third class for combination for single women, Married couples and families located in five compartments parallel to the four layout, two on the saloon deck and three on the main deck. As a seen both Teutonic and Majestic, as well as the newly completed ceramic, a limited number of two buff and four buff cabins were arranged, but were strictly reserved for married couples and families with children. The small of the two saloon deck compartments were designed for married couples. On the main deck, a session of another compartment were designed for families with children. Each of the two compartments also has small dining rooms fastened with fitted tables or swivel chairs, similar to that in second class. In the remaining three compartments, single women were buffed in 20 both dormitory style cabinets situated on the outer side of each compartment. At the center of each compartment, a widened corridor was fastened as a dining room, flung fitted tables and swivel chairs running lengthwise through each compartment. Proposed Sistership Olympic. As why well Stalin typically all those ships in pairs, such a ship for Oceanic to be named Olympic. Not the Olympic of Titanic sister ship, but the Olympic maybe that could have been Oceanic sister ship was proposed. However, following the death of the company's chairman Thomas Ismay in November 1899, the order was postponed and then cancelled. Instead the company decided to deploy resources to produce a set of lots of lines. Larger liners will become the big four class, which we will be talking about in this channel. The name Olympic was later bestowed upon the RMS Olympic of 1910. That was the RMS Olympic, the Olympic I talked about a few minutes ago, Korea. Oceanic was launched on 14 January 1899, an event watched by over 50,000 people. She would be the largest and last British liner to be launched in the 19th century. 
Following her fitting out on sea trials, she left Belfast for Liverpool on the twenty six on the on the twenty sixth August that year. When she arrived, she was opened to the public and press, where she was received with great fanfare. She departed Liverpool on a maiden voyage to New York on six September under command of Captain John G. Cameron. Thomas Ismay has planned to be on board, but on board, but was by this stage too unwell. She completed the voyage in six days, two hours and thirty seven minutes at an average speed of ninety nineteen point fifty seven knots and arrived at New York to a rapturous welcome. One disappointing feature which soon became apparent in so was the tendency for the ship to experience excessive vibration at full speed due into due in part to a long and narrow design. To avoid this problem, it was soon found necessary to operate a hull at a source of speed at a service speed of ninety nineteen point five knots, thirty one point one kilometers per hour, twenty two point four miles per hour, lower than a planned service of twenty one knots, thirty six kilometers per hour, thirty six kilometers an hour, twenty four miles per hour. The early years of Oceanic's career was fairly eventful, as was as he was received by a public on both sides of the Atlantic. Between nineteen hundred and nineteen oh six, she bets her main rival, rivals, Connaught Speed, Queen's Campania, and Lucranda, as well as her own running mate for westbound crossings. In 1900, she was struck by lightning while her dog, at Liverpool, lost the top of her mainmast. On 4 August that year, while while both the New York Harbor, she was threatened by a serious fire in a Congo hall that assists Bovik, who was a dog advocate to her. Fortunately, the fire was brought under control before it was to Oceanic. On 7 August 1901, in a heavy fog near Tuscar Rock, Ireland, Oceanic was involved in a collision with a small waterfall steamship company, SS Karanga, sinking a smaller vessel and killing seven. 18 November 1904, four days out from New York, Oceanic encountered strong gales, stormy seas, and snow. The battering the ship took from the seas, stove in two potholes, which allowed a considerable amount of water to enter the ship. 1945, four of the 45 of the ship's firemen mutinated in protest as the uh, an unpleasant working conditions in the ship's boiler rooms, which resulted in a conviction and imprisonment for the three stokers. 1907, White Star set in place, plans to establish an express source out of Southampton. Another IMM subsidy, the American Line, had experienced great success out of this port due to its proximity to London. It was ultimately decided oceanic, on the Teutonic, majestic, and a newly complete hydraulic would terminate from this port, making double calls at the French port Seboke in the land tradition to the Dominion at Queenstown before sailing for New York. In April 1912, during the parts of Armour Titanic from Southampton, Oceanic became involved in a near collision of Titanic with SS New York when Oceanic was nearby as New York broke from a mooring and nearly collided with Titanic due to a large weight caused by Titanic's size and speed. A month later, mid-May 1912, Oceanic picked up three bodies when the lifeboats left floating in North Atlantic after Titanic sank. After their retrieval from Class 4A by Oceanic, their bodies were buried at sea. World War I an uh, oceanic had been built under a deal of the Admiralty, which made an annual grant towards the maintenance of any ships on a condition that could be called upon for naval work during times of war. Such ships were built to particular naval spec- specifications. In case of oceanic, so that a 4.7 inch gun shield to be given could be quickly mounted. The greatest line of a day was commissioned into naval service on 8 August 1914 as an armed merchant cruiser. On 25 August 1914, the newly designed HMS Oceanic departed from Hampton on naval service that was to last just two weeks. Oceanic, <coughs> sorry. Oceanic was to patrol, patrol the waters from the North Scottish mainland to the Faroes, particularly the area around Setway. She was empowered to stop shipping at captain's discretion, to check cargoes and personnel for any potential German connections. For these duties, she carried Royal, Royal Marines and Captain William Stein RN was appointed in command. A former merchant master, Captain Henry Smith, for two years, service remained in the ship at the rank of Commodore r and Many of the original crew also continued to serve Oceanic. In effect, therefore, Oceanic had two captains. This relieved the confusion about the chain of command. Wrecking. 
Also, you know, had it for scalp or phone opening, but it's main naval anchorage with easy access to the North Sea and Atlantic. From here, she proceeded north to settle and travel and continuously on the standard zigzag course as a precaution against being targeted by U boats. This difficult maneuvering required extreme accuracy in navigation, especially with such a large vessel. In the end, it appears to have been poor navigation rather than enemy action that was due most to Yannick. An accuracy fix, an accurate fix of the position was made on the 9th to 7th of September by navigator Lieutenant David Blair, r and previously assigned to then re resigned from the Titanic. If you didn't know, David Blair was the person that was supposed to be a lookout for the Titanic and had the binoculars but forgot to put them in the cupboard. But forgot to, sorry, but forgot to give them the key for the cupboard that had the binoculars. And so, if David Blair did in fact give him the key, the Titanic may have survived the iceberg. Anyways, now continuing the story of the Oceanic. While everyone on the bridge thought they were well to the southeast of the Isle of Flora, they were in fact estimated 13 to 14 miles farther north than they believed to the east of the island instead of the west. This puts them on direct this puts them directly on course for a reef. The notorious shards of fowl, as known as the Hovida Grund, so marked on charts, which poses poses a major threat to shipping, coming within a few feet of the surface and in calm weather, giving no sign giving no warning sign whatsoever. Captain Slater had retired after his night watch, and aware of the situation, uh, with all to steer the fowl. Commander Smith took over the morning watch. Having previously disagreed with his naval superior about navigating his ship as large as oceanic and dangerous waters around the Scots Islands, he instructed the naval navigator to plot a course west now to sea away, so he thought, from any dangers like outlying, outlying reefs. Unbeknownst to Smith, this put the ship on the coast between the island and reef just south of it. Slater must have felt the coast chain has reappeared on the bridge to come to command Smith's order and may have turned out to be a hasty and ill informed judgment as the ship again changed course directly towards the reef. This ship ran aground in the Salat on the morning of 8 September, approximately 22.5 nautical miles, 5 kilometers east of Fowler's southern tip. She was wrecked in flat, calm, and clear weather. She was the first Allied passenger ship to be lost in the world. She lies at 60, all 7.5. All five north, zero zero one, fifty eight point thirty west. Great reference eight two one, sorry one sorry, zero one one seven two three six nine three seven. Rescue. <coughs> the Aberdeen trawler Glenelka was the first vessel of this on the scene, and thus she attempted to pull off the massive ship, a prior impossible task. The hard ray rupture. Oceanic would now have stayed flowing along, along in open waters. Other ships in the area were called in to assist the rescue operations that was to follow. Other ships' crew transferred to the trawler via the ship's lifeboats and were then ferried to the way AMC HMS Ellison and HMS Forward. Charles Lightall, the ship's first officer, also the most senior officer to try to secure the Titanic, was the last man off, taking the navigator's room's clock as a souvenir. 573 ton amateur savage vessel lioness was dispatched to the scene holy in the walls of the Lair of Fowl. Professor Ian Holborn writes about the disaster in his book, The Eye of Fowl. Fun fact Ian Holborn would be a survivor of the Armist Lusitania disaster and sinking. The launch of the lioness, a savage boat with towed to the scene, was capable at a speed of 10 knots, yet was unable to make any headway against the tide although she tried for 15 minutes. Even then, it was not the top of the tide, and the officer in charge reckoned the full tide would be 12 knots. He confessed he would not have believed if it had he been told. Commander Smith is said to have come and saw the remote island's tiny pier, now looking back out the sea toward the steering of the ship two miles away, commented that the ship was staying on the reef as a monument, nothing would move it. One of the fellow men wise to a full power and forever settling storm, said to have mild with a Zionism, not knowing these parts, yeah, I'll give her two weeks. Remarkably, following a heavy gale that persisted throughout the night, night of 29 September, 
Just two weeks after the incident, the island was discovered the following day this, that the ship has been entirely swall swallowed up by the sea. As she remains to the day, scattered she fell apart under the pressure of the seas of the southern. The disaster was hushed up at the time, the Jews felt that it had been embarrassing to make public how a world famous liner had run aground friendly walls in good weather for fortnight beginnings it served as a naval vessel. The violation of such gross incompetence at this early stage of the world would have done nothing for national morale. Coach Mar Motto Lieutenant Blair was called Marlowe at Denver Port in May 1914, where he was found guilty of stranding or suffering to be stranded. HMS Oceanic was ordered to be reprimanded. He offered his offense that, we, that he was exterminated by, and by the evidence given by Captain Slayton and Commander Swift that was under their supervision that the surrounding was due to an abnormal current. Similar change was made against Commander Smith at a second court martial. The evidence of the prosecution was the same as in the previous case, but what it says was, was well cross-examined with a view to showing that the position of the ac accused, Monsignac, was not clearly defined by the naval authorities, that he was understood to be acting solely in an advisory capacity. It was acquired to the following day, as he was found to not have been in command of 8 September. Captain Slater was also acquitted. Savage. I did only for a salvage company which had been engaged on the scholar German world of a scamper foul, attempted to salvage what remained of the wreck. However, they were unsuccessful. In 1973, another attempt was made to salvage parts of the wreck and the propellers for scrap. Lifeboat. In 2016, Austin Lifeboat 6 was rediscovered and subsequently restored. It is in a collection of the Sandland Museum on Lyric. Lifeboat was one of the last two wife saw in Lifeboat 7 attacked in a row, the other being Lifeboat 2 from SS Nomadic 1911. Well, that was an interesting story of this steamship Oceanic. Thank you all for watching, and remember, on Tuesday I'll be getting a new mic so you can hear me better. Have a great day, night, afternoon, noon, whatever, and I'll see you all next week. Goodbye.